Welcome to the healthiest half hour ish on the internet today. Hi, I am the weight loss champion, Chuck Carroll, and this is the exam room live brought to you by the Physicians Committee. Thanks for joining us here on Facebook or on YouTube, really wherever it is in the world that you are. We appreciate the fact that you are here. On tap today, another big show because there is a major fast food chain running out of hamburgers. And now customers are asking, where's the beef? Meanwhile, new numbers are showing that plant-based burgers are in record demand, and there's also been an about-face in Washington regarding the coronavirus. We're going to have those stories and more in five things that you need to know when we check the headlines in just a little bit. Also on the show today, Dr. Neil Barnard is here talking about a new alarming study on obesity and the risk of COVID-19, perhaps making food choices more important now than ever. Dr. Barnard, looking forward to catching up with you in just a little bit. You said it. We got big news today. And what about the idea that you have to pay out the wazoo to eat vegan? Well, dietitian Lee Crosby will be here to show you how to eat plant-based on the cheap. Lee Crosby, welcome back to the exam room. Glad to be here, Chuck. And we're going to be opening up the doctor's mailbag. So if you have a question for Dr. Barnard or for Lee right now, go ahead and post it in the comment section and we will try to get you an answer by the end of the show today. But we do start with the headlines and five things that you need to know for Thursday, May 7th, 2020. Checking the latest coronavirus numbers, the U.S. has now eclipsed 73,000 deaths during the pandemic. That's more than twice as many as the next hardest hit countries of the United Kingdom and Italy combined. The total number of cases in the U.S. now standing at more than 1.2 million. More than 264,000 people have succumbed to COVID-19 globally. And the White House is doing an about face on plans to disband the coronavirus task force. President Trump announcing the change of heart just a day after Vice President Pence said that the panel would be phased out by the end of the month. Trump says the popularity of the task force led to his decision. And Wendy's is facing a shortage of hamburgers amid the coronavirus pandemic, leaving some customers to ask, where's the beef? An analysis of nearly 200 restaurants finds that 10% of them had nay a burger to be found, only chicken. The company says that some items will temporarily be limited due to supply shortages caused by closures of multiple meat processing plants. And in related news, sales of plant-based meats continue to soar. Beyond Meat reports revenues have increased by 141% this year, with shares jumping 85% since mid-March. Grocers are reporting record demand for beef and pork substitutes. Beyond Meat says April is expected to be its biggest selling month in the history of the company. One executive telling MarketWatch, quote, We have not seen any interruption in our supply chain. And meanwhile, the country's largest pork processing plant is back online following a two-week closure due to an outbreak of the coronavirus where more than 180 workers tested positive. The facility in Waterloo, Iowa, produces about 4% of the entire supply for the U.S. The move comes just days after Tyson reopened another plant in Perry, Iowa, where more than 700 employees had tested positive. And there is a growing number of health officials warning, though, that continued intensive animal farming puts the world at risk for future viral pandemics. Tyson shares, by the way, have shed more than a third of their value. Time now to welcome Dr. Barnard back to the exam room live. And Dr. Barnard, here is the biggest story of the day. There is new evidence that people who are at who are overweight are at even greater risk for COVID-19 than we previously thought. The NIH has apparently been taking a close look at this. And so my question to you is this, we've got a country where two thirds of the country is either overweight or obese. How concerning is this new information? Uh, well, it's very, very concerning. Um, in fact, let me uh, back up just a little bit and share with you something that we talked about three or four days ago, uh, which is gonna set the uh, the stage for what's new. Let me share my screen with you real quickly. Um, okay. Um, we went through this briefly, um, fasten your seatbelt. I just want to give you about 20 seconds of science, if you don't mind. Um, let's say you have more body fat. Standing on the scale, you weigh more than you did before. You got more fat cells. Fat cells express the ACE2 receptor. The ACE2 receptor is the welcome mat for COVID-19. The virus uh, goes into your body, 
And when it finds the ACE2 receptor on the surface of the cell, it can enter the cell. So that has concerned everybody because what that means is um, that fat cells uh, express a lot of this. That means that they are basically harboring lots and lots and lots of COVID-19 viral particles that they can then spew out again like a fountain. The more body fat you have, the more this uh, continues. Mm -hmm. But then part two is that within the lungs, there are also what I'm going to call fat cells in the lungs. They're called uh, lipofibroblasts. They can convert what are called mitochondrial which is muscle fibroblasts from a healthy heart to the hydrotic weapon or oxygen weapon. If you're uh, on a ventilator, you will be able to find the muscle. But um, the diagram of the ventilator is a big block that's that. It's a big block or that's that So that leads us to where we are today. This question, how do I lose weight? And if you'll ask people, some people will say, well, I just got to starve it off. I've got to exercise. Uh, a fair number of people are doing the low carbohydrate diet. And you've heard a lot of discussion on this uh, program. Other people will say, no, plant-based diet is dramatically better uh, in so many ways. Well, Kevin Hall and his research team at NIH tested a low carbohydrate diet and a low fat diet in a group of volunteers who were uh, stuck in their research lab. They couldn't leave. So everybody knew exactly what they were eating every single day. And it turned out that the uh, low carb diet did cause some weight loss, but not anywhere near as much uh, weight loss as the low fat diet did. Now this was a calorie restricted, either low carb or low fat diet. The low fat diet clearly better. This is just the amount of fat that people lost in one day. But day after day after day, the low-fat diet turned out to be better. However, um, when you talk to people about this, they will say, well, wait a minute. The, the, the carb, uh, a low-carb diet has this magical property of producing ketones. When you starve your body for sugar and carbohydrate, your body has to, eat, has to burn on something. It has to burn something. So it makes ketone bodies. And those ketone bodies are theorized to kill the appetite so you lose weight. So if you're on a low carb diet, you just don't eat much food. Vegans will say, wait a minute, it's exactly the opposite. Plant foods have fiber and fiber fills you up. And let me share with you some numbers. Um, some baked beans, five grams and a half a cup, broccoli, five uh, grams in a one cup serving, an apple, just one apple, four grams, an orange, three grams, a banana, three, brown rice, four. Oh, geez, yikes, how'd that get on the list? Cheese is not a plant, so it doesn't have any fiber, and that's true also for chicken or fish or yogurt. Animal products have zero fiber. So which is right? Is the, the going the low-carb ketone body way uh, to kill the appetite, is that the best way to eat less? Or is going the plant-based way, high fiber, is that the way to satisfy the appetite and have you eat less? Okay, just out yesterday, um, Kevin Hall's team at NIH brought in a group of people. There were 20 overweight adults, and half of them went vegan. The other half went on a low-carbohydrate diet. All the food was prepared at the laboratory. The, the patients stayed there, and they could eat as much as they wanted. It was prepared for them. And then after two weeks, they switched. The vegans then did the low-carb diet. The low-carbs uh, then switched to the vegan diet, and the researchers measured how many, how many calories are you taking in? Does the vegan diet suppress your appetite better because it's high in fiber? Or is the low carb diet better because it's um, got ketone bodies that are gonna kill your appetite? What's the answer? Here's the answer. Uh, on the low carb diet, ketones were detected in the blood. They were there, they were supposedly reaching the brain. However, the food intake in the vegan group was less than the low carb group. The vegan diet satisfied the appetite with fewer calories. In fact, a lot fewer, 689 calories less. Here's what it means. Um, if you and your cousin are deciding you want to lose some weight, and he says, I'm going to do it keto, and you say, I'm going to do it low-fat vegan, 
it turns out that you will be satisfied with less food. You'll be very likely better able to lose weight. And that's why we see that in a head-to-head -head trial, plant-based diets do better. Not to mention the fact that it also helps your blood pressure, also helps your LDL cholesterol, which on ketogenic diets tends to get worse. So you want to go vegan. Uh, I'll remind you that we have put this to the test uh, in randomized trials here at our facility here repeatedly. And what we find is that not only do vegans lose weight over the short run, um, but over the long run, that's the way to keep it off. Back to you, Chuck. Oh, oh, by the way, I'm sorry. One last thing, one last thing. It's not just fiber. It's also that your after meal metabolism improves after being on a vegan diet. That's because the fat is getting out of your cells and your body is better able to burn calories. So you're taking less, fewer calories in, you're burning more calories, and there you go. Back to you, Chuck. Uh, okay, so Dr. Barnard, my, my mind is now officially blown. Did you say that in that study, the vegan group ate an average of 689 fewer calories per day? Is that Correct. accurate? Correct. All right, so I, I, when you're saying this, like I busted out my calculator on my phone, and that equates to 4,823,000 ,000 fewer calories per week. And then let's take that down by another, like for the whole year. Like, And, and this is just where it gets absolutely extraordinary. 250,000 fewer calories over the course of one year. That is a huge difference. Well, I got to say, it, it, it's, it makes sense. When you look at large studies of people who have self-selected their diets, the, uh, take the Adventist Health Study 2, which was a goldmine for researchers because it's a huge group of teetotaling, non-smoking people who are health conscious. But those health conscious people who are still eating meat or still eating fish weigh substantially more than the people who are on a plant-based diet, a, a, a vegan diet. And uh, a similar trial called EPIC in uh, Europe showed exactly the same thing, that you, you compare all the groups, those who are eating meat, those who don't eat any meat except fish, those who are lacto-ovo, vegetarian, and those who are vegans. The vegans always have the healthiest body weights of, of any group. So from our standpoint, the debate is really finished. Um, and these decisions about diet choices really now kind of come down to fads. Uh, a fad comes in and do with the cabbage soup diet or the ketogenic diet, but a, a diet based on vegetables and fruits and beans and whole grains is quite clearly the way to go. Unreal. Unreal. There are the numbers right there on the calculator. It does not lie. That is your total annual caloric savings on the vegan diet. That is, that is just amazing to me. Uh, you know what I would love to do? Uh, on the audio version of the podcast, Dr. Barnard, we have a little bit more time to go over these things, maybe do a little bit deeper dive on this. So if you're up for it sometime in the near future, I'd love to bring you on the audio version of the exam room and we can really dive into this and do, you know, some serious analysis. Um, you're on. And not only that, uh, I, I mentioned two studies done by Kevin Hall and his NIH uh, colleagues. Uh, Dr. Hall is actually going to be at the International Conference on Nutrition and Medicine, our, our conference. Uh, which is going to be done virtually August 6th through 8th. So you can actually, uh, participants can ask him questions about his studies and go into much more detail. And yes, you and I, I hope we'll take it up too. Oh yeah, absolutely. I can't pass up on this study. This is this is just extraordinary. Okay, and a reminder for you who's watching right now, if you have a question for Dr. Barnard, go ahead and post it in the comment section. We will be opening up the doctor's mailbag before the end of the show. So go ahead and post that right now. But for the time being, let's change gears. Call it whole paycheck, call it vegan rich, affluent apple eating. There is a widely held perception that you have to be rolling in dough to eat a plant-based diet. But can you eat like a healthy prince while only paying as much as a pauper? You bet, says my next guest. Dietitian Lee Crosby is here now with her top eight cheap eats, vegan style and how to avoid a second mortgage before heading to the store. <laughs> yeah. uh, Lee, <laughs> a lot to tackle here and some really good information to get into. And I also, I have a challenge for you during yes. our discussion and okay. we're going to be taking this whole thing a step further. A belly full of food yeah. three times a day yep. plus a snack. Can we do it for less than $5? Now, <sighs> don't, don't give me your answer right. yet. Sorry. Don't give me your answer yet. Just marinate, marinate on that. But before we get to the challenge, I mean, honestly, <laughs> let's let's start at the top. I mean, what are the foods that we should be buying to really stretch our dollars right now? 
So I've got eight that are top on the list. And this is actually really timely because the numbers just came out this week and an additional 3.2 million people just filed for first time unemployment. So it's more important than ever if you're also trying to deal with getting your own health insurance to keep your health as good as you can get it. So top eight cheap and also really healthy eats oatmeal. We're talking 14 cents a serving and it's really high in soluble fiber to help you lower your cholesterol. Bananas. And I should say, these are all DC area prices. So if you're living pretty much anywhere else in the country, maybe not New York or LA, but everywhere else, it'll be cheaper. Bananas, 27 cents each. Beans, canned or dried. These are affordable. They are filling. Black beans, super high in antioxidants. Half cup serving is a quarter and that's canned. So it gets even cheaper when it's dried. And we'll talk about that because half cup of the cooked dried beans is only 21 cents and canned lentils, 31 cents. And I love those because they're very versatile. Brown rice, $1.49 for 10 servings. So that's about 15 cents a serving, super cheap. Spaghetti, this is one that people think, oh, it's pasta, can it be good for me? It's low glycemic index. And even the white pasta that we think about as being like just carbs has seven grams of protein in a serving. So it's also a great source of protein, 14 cents a serving. So not too shabby. Canned tomato sauce, another incredibly versatile ingredient. A dollar and nine cents for a 28 ounce can. That's 16 cents a serving, high in lycopene. Gentlemen out there, that's good for prostate health. Frozen broccoli. I know frozen foods can be a little hard to come by, but so if you see it, grab it because it's going to give you some big savings. 25 cents a serving and a high vitamin C. And then carrots, you can get a big old five pound bag for $3.79. Again, here at the regular grocery store, no Sam's or Costco. 14 cents a carrot, great for vitamin A in terms of helping keep your immune system healthy. I love it so much. It kind of reminds me you going down that list of the time that you and I went downstairs to actually a boutique grocery yes. store in Washington, D.C., a boutique grocery store. I love Rodman's to death. Boutique grocery store, the prices are slightly higher than a little where you would, you, you would find elsewhere. But you and I loaded up an entire cart full of groceries, enough to feed two people for an entire week for 42 It was in the low 40s, yeah. Absolutely. Yeah, it's impressive. Matter of fact, I got my phone again. It's just that kind of a phone day. Back in uh, May of 2018, that's when wow. this uh, episode was vegan on a budget. If you head over to Apple Podcast and you want to see how we did that, well, go ahead and download that episode. Just look for the exam room by the Physicians Committee. Vegan on a budget episode. Super cool. Now, Lee, that was two years ago. Yes. Let's flash forward to present day. Okay. Maybe there has been some more inflation. So I'm giving you a new challenge. Okay. I'm going to give you $5, yes. $5 a day. You can you put all of this $5. together? <laughs> well, we're going to see if you can. Three meals a day plus a snack for less than $5, all plant-based. Can you do it? Bring it on. Yes, we can. Ooh. Okay. I've got a whole day of yummy food and it comes in not at $5. It comes in under $5. So, all right, put on your seatbelts. We got, and it's tasty too. Strawberry banana overnight oats, right? Super simple. Soy milk, a banana, only half a serving of the frozen strawberries because they're a little pricey, just saying. Um, and what else we got going on there? Two servings of oats because they are not pricey and that's a buck 44 right? And fun fact, 18 grams of protein for everyone who's so worried about protein right now and 13 grams of fiber, beans and rice, and a couple of big old carrots because you want to get your veggies in there. You get a double serving. That's a dollar and eight cents. There is a finance podcasting personality who says when you want to save money or pay down your debt, it's beans and rice, rice and beans. And that is correct. Um, need a snack. Let's do some air pop popcorn, 18 cents in a serving that comes up to about three or four cups popped. And again, seven grams of fiber, four grams of protein, who knew? And then for the piece de resistance for dinner, we're gonna do spaghetti. We're gonna do it with a marinara sauce. And we're not, and this is one you can buy in a can. This is actually, I think a Hunt's brand is what I use for the pricing on this. Um, so you get your spaghetti with your marinara sauce in place of beef, which is not good for you. We are going to use lentils, which are good for you and give it this sort of lovely herbal kind of flavor. And we're going to put some broccoli on the side. You get a double serving of everything on there for $2 and eight cents with 30 grams of protein, 20 grams of fiber. That's less than half the price of these like, you know, value meal kinds of things and way more than twice as healthy. So you ready for the total? Bring it all. All right. $4.78. And for the protein people out there, 76 grams of protein. Again, the female RDA, healthy weight female, 46 grams. For men, it's 56 grams. So 76 grams, y'all, way past the RDA. 64 grams of fiber. The average American's getting like 15 and 1,850 calories. 
So not too shabby. Now, and, and here's the thing that I love so much about this is one, you introduced me to the idea of what I call kitchen sink spaghetti a while ago, where you just throw a whole bunch of stuff oh. in the marinara sauce and make it work. And it's absolutely delicious. It's good, but right? two, like the foods that you just rattled off there, they're not, you're not just gnawing on a stalk of celery all day. Like, <laughs> no. We're really going to fill you up. Girls and gotta eat. <laughs> satisfy that food soul of you. You know what? I, yeah, girls gotta eat. Like that, <laughs> that's some impressive work that you've done. Yeah, I, um, I don't eat like I don't eat like a bird. I eat solid, you know, solid portions, and this is all about the solid portions. And and I think that that that's also a big thing when somebody comes on and they're concerned about losing weight is like they think diet and they're going to have to really cut back on all the food and portions are going to be so small. But with the plant based diet, because we're not just learning here today, but time and time again on the exam room, we've learned, hey, you're not going to go hungry. No, you're absolutely oh, no, not going to go no. hungry. If you're going hungry, you're doing it wrong. <laughs> All right. Well, let's let's uh, turn back to finances now, because I think people sometimes they get intimidated by the produce section. They're like, well, I'm going to buy this now and I know I'm going to need to produce my wallet here when I get to the uh, register and it's going to cost me job. some serious coins. So how can people save when it comes to buying fresh fruits and vegetables? OK, a couple of things. First, we've talked about the cheap keepers. I'm going to bring them back again. These are things like carrots, cabbage, onions, sweet potatoes, romaine, apples and oranges, although they're going out of season. So getting a little pricier. But those are things that not only are inexpensive, they keep a long time and they're super healthy. Next piece is organic is great. I'm all about it. But if it comes down to, oh, I can't afford organic produce, please just go ahead and buy the conventional organic 50 cents to a dollar more per pound. And it's just so much more important to keep eating that produce than to stress about buying the organic. If you want to do a compromise and you're like, well, let's just get the worst offenders out of my diet. You can look up the dirty dozen by the environmental working group. And I'll just list them off to you real quick. These are the most contaminated fruits and vegetables, top 12. Strawberries, spinach, kale, nectarines, apples, grapes, peaches, cherries, pears, tomatoes, celery, and potatoes. What they all have in common is very thin skin, so they can absorb pesticides more. That's one thing. So if you're looking at like a melon or a pineapple, you can feel pretty good about buying that conventional. And then one last tip. This one's my favorite. Are you ready? I'll take that as a yes. All yeah. right. So looking for unit pricing, it is absurd. A lot of the melons, they will sell not based on the pound, but based on just a single unit. So you just, you buy a melon and you can find melons that are twice the size of other melons, but are the exact same price. Cause I've done it with cantaloupes. It's incredible. So when you're looking at that giant bin of cantaloupes or watermelons and it sells for, you know, one or they're two for $4, you just make sure you get the bigger ones and you can save yourself some money without, I mean, literally that is one second of looking for another melon. That's awesome. So now we've talked about the fresh stuff. Let's talk about the frozen stuff. Matter of fact, somebody on YouTube, Luis, uh, just now was asking, what are some of your favorite frozen foods that you stock up on? Which ones do you buy on a regular basis? Uh, personally, I love the stir fry mixes because they're super easy. I'm all about fast and easy. I like to cook, but I don't have time to do it very often. So the stir fry mix is great. Uh, frozen spinach, Holy moly, it is so much cheaper. Fresh six ounces, I've priced this out $3.09. A 16 ounce or you know one pound bag of frozen is 209. So you're getting nearly triple the amount for a dollar less. So that's a biggie. I also like the frozen pepper strips because they're colorful, they're high in vitamin C and they're much cheaper than buying it fresh. And they're great for stir fries, for fajitas, you name it. All right, real quickly, my cost cutting connoisseur, uh, how else can we keep a little extra change in our pocket? Maybe some things that we should be doing before we actually head to the store. Absolutely, this is a little bit home ec, but here we go. It, it makes such a huge difference. Plan your meals and then use that plan to make a shopping list. I know it's basic and I know it's not exciting, but I'll actually be walking people through this at our plant-based immersion this weekend because it does two things. It prevents impulse shopping it actually does a couple of things. It prevents you from buying food you don't have a plan for and so aren't likely to eat. And if you focus on inexpensive meals, you can save a huge amount of money. And then playing off of that, having a smorgasbord meal or even a whole day each week. And I'd say that with my husband, Jeff, we will just put get all our odds and ends in one place and be like, all right, it's almost like an Iron Chef challenge. Does anyone remember that show? Oh, yeah. I love that show <laughs> back in the day. Good. Except there's multiple ingredients and go. What can you make out of this? It's actually a blast and it saves lots of money. Estimates are that 15 to 40% of the food Americans buy winds up in the trash. That is literally like setting your cash on fire. This helps prevent that. And then last one, and this may be a no brainer, but only buy what you use, especially for fresh food. If it's getting up against the edge of what's fresh and what you can use, just go ahead and freeze it. Um, I know it's tempting to stock up, but don't buy more than you can use. 
Right on. All right, Lee, good, good analogy there. It's like setting your money on fire, man. If that doesn't paint a picture, I don't know what does. Uh, all right, so stick around because uh, we still have a case to crack, Lee, and it's time to play Health Boost or Health Bust, where we investigate popular claims on the internet and separate fact from fiction. And today's case, the healthful edible elderberry illusion. Well, Detective Crosby, let's take a look at elderberry supplements. What has your investigation turned up for us? Okay, so these are very popular. I've had people tell me they're taking them. So doing a deeper dive here, they're commonly taken for colds and flu, um, respiratory symptoms. They have not been evaluated at last check for treating or preventing COVID-19, just to put that right out there. But there was a cool study done in 2016, double blind, placebo controlled. So people didn't know if they were getting a pill with an elderberry extract in it or one that had some inert substance in it. And they gave this to 312 international travelers. So seven hour minimum flight because you tend to get colds on a flight. And it was you know about 150 in each group, um, placebo versus elderberry. And they would take it for 10 days before their trip and during the first five or so days of their trip. And what they found was that the placebo group actually had a longer duration of cold episode days, like more than twice as much. And of people who got colds, those in the elderberry group had less severe symptoms. Now, there are some caveats. Funding provided by the elderberry supplement manufacturers, that's strike one. And in both groups, about half the people were using cold medications to help themselves feel better. So the symptom severity, it's kind of hard to know. So. Jury is out, but it's 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 interesting. It was an interesting take on the elderberry situation. Mm. So let's put this case to bed. Final verdict here. Elderberry supplements, would you call them a health boost or a health bust? I hate to put a question mark on this. I'm just going to say verdict. Jury is still out. It is possible they could help reduce symptoms of respiratory conditions, but there's not enough evidence, none of it specific to COVID. And fun fact, not so fun fact, the National Center for Complementary and Integrative Health um, noted that the, and I'm going to quote this because I want people to know, leaves and stems, raw and, and unripe berries and some of the other parts uh, actually can contain a toxic substance that can trigger things like nausea, vomiting, and severe diarrhea. So if you are going to take this, make sure you're using a reliable source that's third-party tested. Personally, I think I'll just stick to a healthy diet. All right. Case is still open. That's, uh, wow. Okay. The side effects don't sound very pleasant there. Yeah, All right. Uh, with caution. <laughs> All right. Thanks, Lee. Uh, time now to open up the doctor's mailbag and answer one of your questions. As always, if you have one, go ahead and post it in the comment section, or you can tweet them to us at Chuck Carroll WLC or at PCRM. Just make sure that you use the hashtag exam room podcast. I want to welcome Dr. Barnard back to the show now. He is the man who will be answering the question after all. And Dr. Barnard, today's question comes to us from Hannah, who wants to clear up some confusion about grains and legumes. She writes, I've heard a lot that grains and legumes cause inflammation and should be avoided for many health issues like RA, heart disease, skin issues. But on a plant-based diet, grains and legumes are widely consumed. I'm feeling, I'm feeling so good eating plant-based versus my former paleo diet, but fear that I'm consuming too many inflammatory foods. I worry I cause my family history has several inflammatory health issues. Is it better? to eat no meat products and more eats and more grains and legumes or vice versa. What do you think here, Dr. Barnard? Okay, well, first of all, it's a great question. It's a timely question because inflammation, its role in health issues is being rapidly uh, elucidated. Uh, what, what does it really mean, by the way? What it means is that the cells of your body are responding to injury. So you're hammering a nail and you accidentally whack your thumb um, or you get a, a thorn or a bee sting or something like that, your, your skin will swell up and it turns red because the blood vessels are enlarging to let blood flow to come in and clean everything up. Um, that's inflammation. But you can have inflammation that isn't just a whacked thumb. Uh, it can go all over your whole body. And what that means is that the cells of the body are releasing compounds that are there to try to destroy invaders and restore healing. But you don't wanna to have too much inflammation because the inflammation itself can be destructive. So um, to your question, be, uh, grains, beans, and other things, are they inflammatory? Um, you might think so if you read some of these books that talk about lectins. Um, this is a topic that comes up every now and then um, due to a, sort of an 
may I say, in internet theory, except that it's in books too, um, in which they will say that if you eat beans and grains, that they could be pro-inflammatory because of the lectins they include. Cook them. If you cook your, don't eat uncooked grains. I mean, you really can't anyway. Don't eat uncooked beans. Um, you should cook them. The lectins are dramatically reduced. And people who consume these foods actually do dramatically better than people who consume meat. Uh, the foods that tend to spark inflammation the most, actually the top of the list, it's the dairy group, specifically probably the dairy protein. So even the low fat uh, dairy products are a problem. Now, if you're wondering, how does this really apply to you as an individual? Can you actually get tested? And the answer is yes, you can. Um, you said you've had uh, inflammatory conditions in your family. Next time you see your doctor and your doctor's doing your annual physical or whatever, uh, in addition to the regular tests that your doctor uh, draws, there's a very inexpensive test called CRP or C-reactive protein. It's a good index of inflammation. And what almost always happens in every study that we've seen where this has been measured when people transition to a plant-based diet is CRP doesn't get worse. In other words, inflammation isn't getting worse. CRP goes way down. And we see this uh, in people with inflammatory conditions like arthritis, but also just in regular folks, they do tend to do dramatically better. So that's a way to get tested, but a plant-based diet is the best diet for fighting inflammation. You can test it for yourself by checking your CRP with your physician if you'd like. All right. And if we didn't get to your question today, have no fear. Go ahead and keep posting it in the comments section. Always more opportunities in the future for us to open up the doctor's mail back at least once a day. So go ahead and post yours now. Uh, Dr. Barnard, I actually want to bring Lee in for this next discussion as well, because we've talked a lot about the Barnard Medical Center and telehealth visits of late. And the cool thing about them is that patients don't even need to leave their home to meet with our doctors and nutritionists. But Dr. Barnard, I want to ask you again, in your opinion right now, how important is it that people really stand up and take control of their health, given that most areas now are beginning to reopen and experts are projecting that we're gonna see another spike in cases of COVID-19. How important is it right now that we really take control of the things that we can take control of with our health? Well, it's more important now than ever. Um, and I was just talking uh, the other day with, with another uh, expert in cardiology and he was saying to me, we've got two pandemics. What he meant was we already had a pandemic of obesity and all the things that go along with it, like high blood pressure and diabetes. He said that that pandemic is continuing. Now we have an infectious pandemic of COVID-19 and one makes the other worse. So the good news is that when people do lose weight, when they reduce their blood pressure and control their diabetes, there it, it appears that their susceptibility to a bad outcome with COVID uh, is greatly reduced. So in addition to washing your hands and wearing your mask and social distancing, nothing like a vegan diet to get your body uh, uh, stronger and in better control. And Lee, from the standpoint of a dietitian, if somebody comes to you and they lay out their food journal, what they've been eating for the last few days, how are you able then to optimize that menu and really focus on those underlying conditions that increase the risk of COVID-19? So what we'll do is we'll go through and see what their conditions are. We'll look at what they are eating. And again, a lot of people are doing a lot of things, right? So we're going to basically ramp up what's what's doing well for them, whether they are aware of it or not. And then looking to those things that some people are doing pretty well, but they are just stuck or they're getting sabotaged. So we're going to sort of suss those out. We'll find what's causing trouble. If they're having other symptoms too, maybe they're having some GI issues. We'll go and see if there are any, any foods that might be causing issues there. And we'll get them on a meal plan that helps them feel better while they are resolving hopefully resolving those chronic diseases that can make COVID-19 worse. So it's really a full, it's a full spectrum evaluation and approach. And you can see the number up on your screen right now, hopefully 202-527-7500, or you can visit barnardmedical.org. Right now we're available for telehealth visits in California, the Washington DC area, that's including Maryland and Virginia, Massachusetts, Missouri, New York, Arizona, Colorado, and breaking news, Lee, where else can people tap into BMC? Also the great state of Kentucky. Yeah, your old Kentucky home, that's gotta be exciting for you, huh? It's both sides of my family are from there, one from Eastern Kentucky and one from Louisville. So we've got the whole state covered. 
That's fantastic. You know, I'm so excited. And I, I would think that these telehealth visits right now, they're just so critically, critically important. You know, as people are still on this lockdown and they're still nervous to leave their homes, but we can still get them on the right track to a healthier path and and without, you know, having that anxiety of actually leaving and going to the doctor's office. So uh, my, my hat is off to you for everything that you and your colleagues at the Barnard Medical Center are doing. Well, thank you, Chuck. All right. And uh, to say that today has been an interesting show would be an understatement, my friend. But there is more. There is still more exam room out there because I have an interview with Dr. Michael Greger. That is on the audio version of the podcast right now. And it is a fun one for sure. He and I got together during the Fairfax Virtual Veg Fest. And this really wasn't even a sit down interview because he was walking on a treadmill the entire time. So during this walk that we took together. Uh, he was giving us tips on how to survive a pandemic and the changes that we need to make as a society to avoid another one in the future. So fun and powerful, all good stuff. And we talk about his new book and take a peek into his pantry. What's his favorite bean? Well, he finally let us in on that. So head over to Apple Podcast or Spotify or Stitcher, wherever shows are available. Look for the exam room podcast by the Physicians Committee. Go ahead and hit that subscribe button and please leave a five-star rating because yes, this show is all about having fun, but at the heart of it, it's also about getting life-changing and life-saving information out there. And every time that we get a new subscriber and somebody leaves that five-star rating, it helps get this information in front of people who need it the most. So please, if you could head over to Apple Podcasts and subscribe today, that would be phenomenal. And on this show tomorrow, oh my goodness gracious, Dr. Jim Loomis will be here. You know him from the movie, The Game Changers. He's also the medical director of the Barnard Medical Center and a former team doctor for the NFL. Now, here's why this is important, because the league is going to announce its schedule for the upcoming season tonight. This is a big to do for sports fans. So the question for Dr. Loomis becomes, what can be done to keep the players safe during this pandemic? And what about those big linemen who are 300 pounds or more? Are they at greater risk for COVID-19? Uh, they got the BMI to, to say that maybe they are, but what does the doctor say? Because they're also in good shape. So this is going to be an interesting conversation, and I hope that you join us for that. And that is at noon Eastern, right back here on Facebook and YouTube, the exam room live tomorrow. Be sure to tell your friends, tell your family, tell everybody. They all need to join us for this one. But until then, my thanks again to Dr. Neil Barnard and Lee Crosby for their time today. And for everyone here at the Physicians Committee, I am the weight loss champion, Chuck Carroll. Thank you so very much for taking your time to join us today and have yourself a healthy Thursday. We'll talk to you tomorrow.